My name is Michelle Cook and I'm the Senior Director of Development at Old Salem. In each episode of Things, our goal is to use objects to draw larger connections between people across historical, geographic, social, and political lines. In today's episode, we're going to look at two historical spaces that are linked by a common bond of memory and trauma. Memories and trauma that some would prefer to forget. Beirut's Yellow House sits in the center of the city. During the Lebanese Civil War, the building's location along the city's green line, as well as its height and open architecture, provided a strategic vantage point for warring factions and their snipers. Badly damaged during the conflict and only recently established, stabilized and preserved, the Yellow House evokes memories of the country's long and bloody civil war. Like the Yellow House in Beirut, Salem's Tavern in the city of Winston-Salem also sat on a line of demarcation, a line between Moravians and non-Moravian visitors to the town of Salem. Upstairs in the tavern is a small room that was once home to those who were enslaved in Salem. Unrestored and until recently inaccessible to the public, this space has been designated as a room of reflection dedicated to those who were enslaved in Salem. In today's episode, we're going to explore these two spaces separated by more than 6,000 miles but closely linked by memories and trauma. Joining us for this conversation are Frank Fagnoni, President and CEO of Old Salem Museums and Gardens and the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts in Winston-Salem. We're also delighted to welcome Nelly Aboud, archeologist, museum educator, and founder and director of Museo Lab in Beirut, Lebanon. We look forward to a robust conversation as Nellie and Frank explore the question, why do we remember and preserve spaces filled with the memories of trauma? For those of you joining us live, we encourage you to be a part of the conversation. Please type your questions in the Q&A and we'll address them at the end of the program. Let's get started. Let me introduce Frank Vagnoni. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, Frank. In March of 2017, Frank began his tenure as the 111th president and CEO of Old Salem Museums and Gardens in Mesda. Before joining Old Salem, Frank served as the executive director of the Historic House Trust in New York City, overseeing the operations of 23 house museums. He also served as executive director of the Philadelphia Society for the Preservation of Landmarks and the executive director of historic preservation and operations at the Bryn Athen Cathedral Complex in Bryn Athen, Pennsylvania. An internationally renowned thinker, writer and consultant in the fields of historic preservation and museums, Frank is the founder and president of Twisted Preservation Cultural Consulting and co-author of The Anarchist Guide to Historic House Museums, a best-selling book on creative approaches to presenting the past. Frank, thanks for starting us off this afternoon. Thanks, Michelle. And I'm so happy to have um, my dear friend Nellie um, to have this conversation with. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in and share my screen. I would like to start off with a land acknowledgement and given that we're on Zoom, it really isn't specific to where I'm located, which is in North Carolina, but I've, um, in my case, um, put North America up and the indigenous um, native peoples tribes the map is um, expressing that. And then in the bold, I have the specific uh, tribes um, that are in um, North Carolina in the place that I am speaking from. I'd like to start with this quote from a um, book by Stanley Tigerman. It's, we're in a time between times and a place 
which is no place. And it really does speak to um, the conversation that um, Nellie and I and Martha Hartley, um, uh, Director of Moravian Research, will be having um, in a little while. And it's, it's that um, even though we're talking about, in this case, two architectural artifacts, um, we're really speaking about things that are out of time and out of place. For those of you that are joining us and are not um, aware of where North Carolina is, um, the top map shows you the United States, the arrow points to where the state of North Carolina is located, and then within the state of North Carolina is Winston-Salem, and that's where Old Salem, the living history site is located, and the picture on the bottom right shows you that Old Salem um, is located dead center of Winston-Salem. Old Salem is a living history site that illustrates the Moravian settlement of the town of Salem from around 1766. And if you were to visit today, it's a fairly traditionally preserved um, location um, with um, very, very highly restored buildings. And if you look at the bottom uh, images with the timeline, you can also see that it, it's also been interpreted in a very traditional way with costumed interpreters. And I'm showing you photographs from 1950 to 2000. And what you can tell is that things haven't changed that much in the way that Old Salem has presented itself and interpreted its history. The building that I want to talk about specifically today is the historic tavern and it exists within the historic district of Old Salem today. It's the red dot I'm showing you on that site map. And then I have four photographs showing you the restored tavern and then interior shots. And the interior of the tavern is a fairly traditionally restored and interpreted and furnished historic site. Um, in 1966, I believe it became a National Historic Landmark. And I'm showing you at the bottom of this page um, some architectural drawings from that landmarking process. Um, when I arrived in December of 2016, the room that we're going to speak about today in Old Salem um, was used as a storage room. This is a photograph I took of that room. And on one of the bottom floor plans, you'll see an area in pink. It was designated in 1937 as a dining room for the tavern. Um, but now we believe that this room was used as the um, dwelling place for enslaved who lived and worked at the tavern. Interestingly, if we look at uh, paintings of the period, and I'm showing you two separate paintings, the top one from 1787, I'm showing you on the um, left the full painting and on the right a detail of the painting, and I have a red circle around what is the historic tavern illustrated in this painting. Something to really take note of is that the tavern is pushed far out of town. And the top painting really makes that clear, that the tavern was to be located in an area that would really segregate it from the rest of the Moravian town. You go a few decades later in 1819, again, the tavern is shown kind of in this murky dark area between the limbs of the trees, really in a way kind of physically symbolically representing this separation from the rest of this settlement. And even though buildings have grown towards the tavern location, just by comparing the two photographs, you still get a sense that the tavern was considered the other. And in looking more <clears throat> in detail, um, on the left of this page is, a, is an urban plan of 1798, and I'm showing you the location of the tavern in the red dot. On the right, I'm showing you the same map, except that I'm really kind of expressing a quality of macro symbolism that's built into the town plan. And that is that if you look at the very top right, 
you see God's Acre Cemetery. That's, that's really considered the most important spot in the town. Um, and that yellow line, dashed line going down, takes you to the red block. And that red block is designating that line of demarcation um, that is in a way perceptibly because if you think about those paintings that I showed you in the previous slide, there was considerable distance between the town of Moravian believers and the tavern, which is where non-Moravians would come to Salem and stay. Not only is that where the strangers came and they labeled them strangers, it was also the location where visiting enslaved individuals were housed across the street from the tavern, um, either in tents or literally on the ground. And then enslaved would also be housed in the tavern barn. Also located in this red area, which is south of God's Acre, is what was started in 1772 and then 1816, the Stranger and the Negro God's Acre. So even in the cemetery, the segregation between the Moravians and then um, with a few exceptions, the enslaved Moravians and the strangers were placed in this red block of land. And then eventually in 1823, to really solidify this um, separation and segregation of the town, the church for the enslaved in 1823 was placed. So what this diagram should show you that embedded into the urban plan of Salem is this kind of separation between the two parts. Now, this is the floor plan of the tavern. And although this conversation is not about architecture, what I find fascinating is that the architecture embeds in within itself this idea of segregation. So I'm showing you the floor plan and the wide red line that's being shown vertically is really showing you a wall, which is the front wall of the tavern, which has no windows in it. So even though it was part of an area that was segregated from the town, even the building had another layer of segregation to it. So the strangers living inside of it would not be seen by the believers from Main Street. And that's what that dark red line is. And then even within the tavern is another level of demarcation and that is the dashed red line. And as we said, we are now studying the enslaved at Salem in ways that are bringing about much more information. And um, conjecturally, we believe that the enslaved were kept on this back L wing of the tavern. Um, and then I'm showing you the same site plan of the town of Salem in the bottom left. And I'm showing you how that wide red line corresponds with Main Street. So it really was a very conscious effort in a physical way to manifest this notion of segregation. And then the room that we're speaking about specifically today is yet another level of segregation. And that is that the enslaved who worked on this back L of the building also, we believe, lived on this upper floor, these two bed chambers. We conjecturally believe that there were two bed chambers. Now, one of the things that we started in 2016 was an expansion of what had already begun in the late 90s, which was a study of the enslaved in the town of Salem. Um, and I'm showing you um, a map of Salem and Winston-Salem eventually. And all of those red spots are a kind of compiled um, illustration of where the enslaved lived in the town of Salem up to um, the Civil War. And then part of the Hidden Town Project is that we've really jumped in and tried to study as much as we can um, the narrative of the enslaved and I'm showing you on the far right one of our text panels um, that now are in all of the buildings. 
So as we learn more information about the enslaved, that um, when you come to Salem, that you will understand that there were in fact enslaved individuals in the town of Salem. Now, when we speak specifically about the tavern and the room of reflection, which is that room I showed you where we believe the enslaved lived who helped run the tavern, we've started to, through the hidden town process, actually find names. Our goal is to form a descendant community who can help advise Old Salem on ways that we can interpret the narrative of the enslaved. And I'm showing you here the text box that exists in the Tavern Room of Reflection. Um, and Martha can speak to this um, later on, that it's a fairly complicated history, but through Martha's research, we're actually starting to find names of people um, who lived here and potentially lived in what is now the Tavern Room of Reflection. And as you can tell, even with just this one note that um, Adam and his wife, we think, um, lived and worked at the tavern um, and Adam's wife was sold to a slave trader. So you can imagine the level of trauma and memory um, that would be involved with, for instance, living and working at the tavern. And a lot of this is conjectural now, but um, as we do more research, we get closer and closer to the truth. Again, the top picture on the right is how I discovered this room in 2016, which was a storage room. And then the bottom picture is the Tavern Room of Reflection today. Um, we've moved church benches into that room. We've cleaned it out, stabilized it. Um, and those benches come from the African-American brick church on our property. And this is where the enslaved were told that they were freed after the Civil War. And we moved three of these pews into this room. This room is now open to the public. It's unticketed. Um, and we've had people come and um, do discussions and conversations. And I'm showing you once again the floor plan on the left. And in green, I'm showing you what was the room for the enslaved to live as bedchambers is now our historic tavern room of reflection. And then I'm just showing you a few photographs um, that we just took of ways that we have just stabilized the preservation of this room um, because we turned this into the tavern room of reflection almost immediately after starting the Hidden Town Project in 2017. And as you can tell, the room itself is fairly barren. We decided to not have anything textural or interpretive in the rooms that we wanted the experience to really be about reflection and memory on the enslaved in the town of Salem. Again, not about the architecture, but about the behaviors and activities that took place within that room. One of the things that we've done is we've produced a, um, a program called Sounds of Hidden Town, and we've asked composers to compose music, contemporary music, that we would eventually, and we were doing this right before COVID hit, um, that we would make these compositions part of the visitor experience. What I'm doing is giving you a very short example of one of these compositions. And this composition was produced specifically for the Tavern Room of Reflection.
April posted a comment that that composition really does hit at your heart. Mm -hmm. I've heard it before, and I'm sitting here just feeling myself trying to gather my myself. Thank you for sharing that powerful composition, uh, Frank, and for such a thought-provoking presentation this afternoon. For those of you who are joining us, uh, you heard Frank mention uh, Martha Hartley a couple of times. Martha is the director of our Hidden Town Project, and we've got a real treat for you. You're going to be able to meet Martha and ask her a couple of questions later in the presentation. And before we bring in Nellie, just a reminder that if you've got questions, if you would just drop them in the Q&A, we'll address as many of them as we can at the end of the program. And now joining us all the way from Beirut is Nellie Aboud. Nellie is known internationally as a thought leader on issues of memory as a form of preservation. She's a museum educator, currently serving as acting ethnographic museum curator in the Department of Archaeology and Museology at the University of Balamad. Nellie served as cultural manager at the Museum of Contemporary and Modern Art and also at the University of Balamad, served as a research assistant in the Department of Archaeology and Museology. Nellie is the founder of Museo Lab that promotes Lebanese cultural history through hands-on interactive experiences. Her research focuses primarily on cultural heritage, public archaeology, and museum education. Nellie, welcome to Things. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I am so happy to be here with you today. Uh, so just let me correct something. I no longer work at the University of Balamand and I'm only freelancing for Museo Lab, the NGO that I founded. So um, just that. So um, thank you so much again for having me and thank you, Franklin, for uh, this uh, really interesting and exciting presentation. So I'm so happy today to be presenting uh, the Bekat building, a building that is really dear to my heart. So I will be telling you the story of uh, the Barakat building and how this state of art building was transformed into a site of memory of uh, Beirut. I will try to make it as short as possible so you will have more time for the discussion later on. So let me just uh, share my screen. So I will be, as I said, presenting Beit Beirut, the site of memory and amnesia. Um, so the Beit Beirut, or as uh, known locally as the Barakat building, there you go, as the Barakat uh, building, uh, or also known as the Yellow House after the ochre sandstone that you can see here in the picture, which is uh, which it is built. It is located in the area of Ashrafiyeh, once called Nasra, and now more commonly known as uh, Sodeco or Sodeco Square. So it is located in the heart of Beirut, the capital of uh, Lebanon. This building was a residential one built uh, by the Barakat family, that's why it is called the Barakat building. And it was built between 1924 and 1932 by two eminent architects, Yusuf Aftimus and Fuad uh, Qazah. So this building has great architectural values representing the start of modernity in Beirut in the style known as the Yellow Houses. Uh, it was one of the first building uh, that included concrete and not only stones. Uh, and its uh, construction, the building also is a witness of the use of the void in the middle of the building and the use of handrails that only has served as for aesthetic reasons and not for functionality. So at the time of uh, its construction, the building was a state of the art marking the transition between old and modern techniques and architecture. So as um, as I said, it comprises two bourgeois style houses four stories high, plus a roof terrace. And um, the central axis of the building is completely open to the sky. So it leads to the main entrance and a front, uh, front courtyard giving access to staircases up to the properties and a passageway under the building that leads to the leafy rear courtyard. So the facades of the two buildings are joined by raised concrete columns and decorated with fine ironwork, static handrails overlooking the city. So I'm just describing a little bit the building because later on, you will know 
how this building and this architecture was used by the new occupiers of the building later on during the war. So um, the architect who uh, designed this building made it possible for anyone sitting in any room inside of this building to be able to the, see the city outside and feel connected to it. So um, the Barakat building was also home on the ground floor, as you can see here in the pictures, for uh, a salon de coiffure, a coiffure salon called Ephraim uh, Coiffure, and also a small studio here called uh, Photomario and also a dentist clinic. So far, it all seems so calm, beautiful, and peaceful. But what happened next? So in April 1975, the war broke out in Lebanon, transforming the Barakat building into a sniper's nest situated on the green line, the demarcation line, dividing Beirut into east and west. So the building was quickly abandoned by its uh, residents and to be occupied by uh, snipers. So here you can see a picture of some of these uh, snipers. So the building played a really important role during the Lebanese war that lasted for 15 years from 1975 to 1990. And it was used, as I said, as a sniper's den and like many other like buildings along the Green Line. The building was called during this period, the building of deaths or a killing machine. Uh, the intersection was also called intersection of deaths, a sniper's nest, etc. And it no longer was called a Barakat building. So snipers occupying the building uh, made use of the architect, architecture, sorry, to hide behind blind walls. The building suffered from bullets, from uh, bombs, uh, bunkers were installed inside, as you can see here, and many different graffiti was drawn by the snipers on the walls of this building, like this one, for example, that says "shta'tilak habibi" in Arabic, which means "I miss you, my love." And here's another one, a graffiti also by uh, one sniper called Tarazan or Katol. And it says, if Gilbert's love is a crime, let the history witness that I am a dangerous criminal. Signature, Tarazan Katal. And uh, by the way, Katal was a famous brand in Lebanon for uh, mosquito repellent. So um, after the war, at the end of the 1990s, the building was, as I said, covered with these traces and scars of the war and different installations inside. In 1994, it was supposed to be uh, demolished. Um, and uh, however, Lebanese heritage activists resisted. And after years of advocating and protesting, the decision to demolish it was reversed. And instead, its ownership was transferred to the Beirut uh, municipality in 1998 and formalized by the signing of an expropriation decree in 2006. So here you can see uh, the building after the war. Uh, the first picture is from 1994, another one from 1998. And as you can see on the bottom here on the ground floor, uh, Salon Ephraim reopened in the 90s after the war and uh, remained uh, open until the expropriation by the municipality in uh, 2006. So the municipality, um, I'm going to show you before a video of Mona Halla. Uh, she is an architect and an activist and also a professor at the American University of Beirut. Uh, I will show you like a few seconds uh, and you can find the full episode on uh, YouTube. So just uh, hear her talk about the building. I teach every single day in Beirut, and we are fighting every single day in Beirut, and we hear the news that it's bad every single day in Beirut. This place must try to reconcile the Lebanese together, not by talking and having lectures, by showing them how beautiful their city is. We have very superficial relationship to our city. We don't belong really. We want this place to be a place of belonging. If we can do this in this place, then we have succeeded in having big Beirut. So uh, this was short, but again, you can uh, watch the whole uh, episode on uh, YouTube and it's really interesting. Um, so the municipality, after expropriating the building, 
uh, partnered with the French Embassy here in Beirut and also with the Paris municipality to accomplish uh, this project. Here you can see the plan of uh, the building. So architect Yusuf Haidar uh, was appointed as project manager and Haidar had a very special and avant-garde restoration vision. So um, he decided to treat the building as a 92 years old living being suffered from many, many uh, wounds, had scars, and also a few missing parts. So uh, his approach was like sur uh, surgical stitching. And he tried, here you can see a picture during uh, the beginning of the restoration work. Um, so the approach of Haidar was like surgical stitching, like healing the wounds and using uh, prosthetic uh, elements uh, to replace the missing pieces. So here you can see two pictures of uh, the restoration work and you can see clearly here, these missing uh, parts were replaced by gray metallic pieces uh, representing uh, the implants that injured people and wounded people from the war would have. Uh, so his vision was so amb ambitious as the choice of replacing these misses, uh, missing pieces was only technical and structural. So when it wasn't necessary, the missing pieces were not replaced and were left empty. So the prosthetic kind of like gave a new life to the building, but also marked the absence, the void, emptiness left after the war. So all these traces have, uh, have been preserved as clear reminders of the memory of Beirut and constituting, according to Yusuf Haidar, permanent museum collection. So the or original structure has been reinforced and as you can see in the plan here, a new modern extension was added to the old Ottoman style building in order to have new facilities such as an auditorium, library and a cafe. So, of course, this vision was criticized by um, many uh, like professional people, architects and museum and heritage professionals. And some considered that such an approach disfigured building, more, uh, making it look ugly. Others also deemed this approach as an avant-garde. But of course, as uh, you already saw that the building left after the war was far from being beautiful or complete. So the scars were kept, and even sometimes were put on display as we are going to see in the next slides, um, making them sometimes also more visible. And the renovation works finished in 2013, but the building was only reopened and inaugurated as an urban cultural center in 2016. So um, after the reopening, uh, many events, talks, projects, Place inside of the building. Uh, I would only cite two of, that, two of them that I find really interesting and exciting. Uh, the first one is a Photo Mario exhibition. So as, as I said before, uh, this building on the ground floor had shops and uh, one of these shops was a, a photographer studio called Photo Mario. So the activists that worked on preserving this uh, building decided to, uh, when they entered the building after the end of the war, they found pictures left inside of the studio and also negatives uh, of pictures. So they decided to reprint these pictures and to organize an exhibition. And also they printed postcards that you can see here. And uh, they were also a sign outside, um, the sign of the shop, Photo Mario. And these postcards also were distributed to uh, visitors when visiting the place. Another event was an exhibition by uh, Zain Al Khalil, uh, who is a multimedia visual artist. And uh, the exhibition was called uh, Healing Lebanon. Uh, through art. Uh, the event included various works of art, workshops, uh, panels, uh, poetry readings, performances, and also other, um, other activities. And uh, this, of course, animated uh, this building and presented a message of peace, love, and tolerance uh, in Beirut. And here you can see also a visitor uh, weaving uh, woolen patches on a loom to cover bullet holes on the building. So that was really a nice and interesting and exciting project. And here you can see uh, different words in Arabic. Uh, 
um, like Ghuflan, Rahma, Salam, Ashok, that means uh, forgiveness, peace, mercy, and passion. All this was part of the same exhibition of uh, Zain al Khalil. So, um, and, uh, recently, uh, in 2019, during the 17th of October uprising, cultural professionals from different fields used to meet at Beirut. So they used this building this intersection as a meeting point, and they marched together to the Beirut Center District, where the central protest was taking place. So the protesters gathered there, and they were demanding change regarding cultural policies and funding, along, of course, with their social uh, demands. And here you can see the banner uh, that was hung uh, from the rooftop of the building on one of the facades. Uh, it says at the end, towards a diverse and free culture. Um, most uh, recently, and following the 4th of August, a massive explosion that hit the port of Beirut, a fundraising campaign also took place inside this building in August 2020, and uh, with a banner that you can see here hung outside, mentioning the names of the 204 victims that lost their lives uh, during uh, this blast. So, um, as you can see, the building is the space and the building is still standing as a witness of these difficult times that destroyed and dismantled Lebanon social, political, and economic fabric. And it's still like a living monument connected to the city uh, with many different events happening inside and outside this building. So um, in my last part, I am going maybe to ask many questions without necessarily giving answers to all of them. Uh, but kind of like opening the discussion later on during the Q&A session. So um, first question is why we need to preserve this building. So um, at the launching of the restoration works in October 2012, the building was baptized as the Museum of the Memory and the History of Peru. Yusuf Haidar concept note that you can see here on the screen defines the building as a living cultural center dedicated to the memory and the history of Beirut that would help achieve a clear memorial duty. He continues and says that after the war, we, and he means we as the Lebanese people, just went from general amnesty to general amnesia. In this project, the idea was to preserve all the traces of time. Lebanon, I find that this, what Yusuf Haider said is really like a, a powerful message. Um, Lebanon has been diagnosed by scholars, activists, artists as suffering from social amnesia, like lost memory, from hypomnesia and also hyperamnesia. The casual talk that I had with the next fighter that uh, fought during the Lebanese war, when asked about the war and what it meant be for him now, where it meant for him now, sorry, he stated that for him it was like we collected all the trash and uh, the dust and kind of hid it under the carpet, but we did not really clean the house. We did not mourn our bloody and difficult past, but instead, instead we pretended that nothing happened and we moved on. But, as he says, our house is still dirty and filled with heavy and unwanted elements. This complex statement caught between the contradictory forces of collective remembrance and social forgetting is demonstrated in Rulas and Triti, a 22 years old university student that you can read here on the screen. I'm going to read it because it's really also like conveys a powerful message. I don't know if I can even talking about the war. I don't know if I can even talk about it. I mean, if there's something in society that helps you to think about it, everything encourages us to escape. Nothing encourages you to deal with it, to face it, nothing. They don't even talk about it anymore. And even if they do, it's from different perspectives, a theory, an idea, not specific facts. I mean, it's very dangerous to awaken something that's not yet ready to be awakened. It's not easy to remember, and it's such a blessing to forget sometimes. 
But if you want to remember and you want to deal with it, and I hope each one of us will want to face something, and when he is ready, that it will help. This reminds me of a saying uh, inspired from the Bible that we sometimes use here in Lebanon. It says something like, God has blessed a human being with many gifts, and one of the most important amongst them is the gift of forgetting. So here, uh, this, help, this gift helps humans move on and cope with the pain. So here you can read, it's from Hebrews 8, 12, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. I thank God for the gift of forgetting. It gives time for us to heal and it aids forgiveness process. So another interesting also statement, and here I would like to ask many questions that we can maybe try and answer later on during the discussion uh, session. Ashraf Osman, in his memory for forgetfulness, argues that architecture is an ideal vehicle for memory, but also for forgetting. With her selective process, architecture embodies an act of exclusion as well. What to remember and what to forget? And why do we need to remember and why do we need to forget? And most importantly, who gets to decide what to preserve and what to demolish? Um, and last but not least, I would like also to raise an important point that I would like also to discuss with you later on. Um, I will just put it out there and discuss it with you later on. Uh, is an argument that surrounded the opening of the Barakat building. This argument focused on the lack of any collections that might make this building a real museum. But what is a real museum? After all, what is real and authentic? And what is exactly a real museum? Orhan Pamuk, the famous uh, Turkish novelist, founded the Museum of Innocence in Istanbul and that has the same name of uh, his novel, Museum of Innocence. The museum is all made out of fake collections. Pamuk says in his novel, real museums are places where time is transformed into space. Nowadays, many heated debates are taking place inside the International Council of Museums about the very definition of a museum. Museums work with narratives. And what makes any narrative relevant is its personal and emotional aspect, in my opinion. So what is more, I ask here, what is more personal than uh, someone's home, someone's childhood, family, friends? And what is more real and authentic than a love story between two gay snipers falling in love with each other in a time when there wasn't even a bit acceptable by society under the sound of the bombs and during a civil war? Isn't it personal? Isn't it relevant? And isn't it authentic and real? So in my opinion, Bit Beirut is a place that tells stories of who we were, of who we are, and who we might be in the future. So we remember, reflect, feel, think, sorry, <laughs> think, plan, and evolve. Studies show that visitors to museums often remember and would consider coming back to a museum if the visit triggered emotion, be it nice, lovely feeling or a sad, confused feeling. Museums can help people make sense of our complex and nuanced world that doesn't come with any simple solutions or answers. I remember personally the first time I visited the building during the restoration works. Uh, it was in 2014, I guess. I was lucky and we were lucky enough as a group to have Yusuf Haider himself facilitating the tour. So uh, we had with us a member of the Barakat family and people who were living in this area during the war. So I remember that many people visiting the place for the first time after you know, being open. Uh, they couldn't continue the visit. And the visit and the impact of the building was so emotionally powerful that they had to go out, outside to rest before coming back in and continue their visit. However, after all this being said, um, Beirut is still not open for the public, except on rare occasions and for special events due to unknown reasons and many political pressure. So it's an iconic symbolic building for the city. It's still a building breathing life uh, through and into the city. The building itself fulfills 
in my opinion, the mission of a museum. No need to have a sign, no need to have a banner. Outside, the building went from being the Barakat building into a living monument, a museum of and for the memory of Beirut. It became Beit Beirut, and uh, you know the word Beit in Arabic, in Lebanese Arabic, it means house or home. And the uh, homes are places made by the people and their stories, sad or happy ones. I personally like the name Beit Beirut, an inviting name, maybe breaking the traumatic image that this building has and the collective memory of uh, the Lebanese people. It is a place that tells the story of Beirut with all its contradictions. So the snipers read the stories of this building for 15 years. Now it is time for the Beirutis and the Lebanese to weave new stories and maybe stories of peace, reconciliation and love and reclaiming the space as theirs. Um, I would like to end with this slide. Um, following the 4th of August explosion, uh, Lebanese are demanding the preservation of the silos uh, where a massive explosion happened on the 4th of August, destroying a large part of the city, killing 204 people, injured more than 6,000 people, and leaving an estimated 300,000 people homeless. So the activists are demanding the preservation of the site as a memorial, as a site of conscience, where we can go remember, reflect, and maybe, just maybe one day forgive, but most importantly, so we won't forget and we hold each and every single responsible person accountable. Thank you so much for uh, listening. And this is also another uh, picture from uh, a building located in Jamaisi Street in Beirut that was also um, damaged during uh, the force of Oakland. August explosion. The banner uh, is by an illustrator, a cartoonist, famous one uh, called The Art of Bo. It says, resist, resist, rebuild. Thank you again. Truly, these stories will um, never end. I want to thank you on behalf of everyone who's joining us today for bringing us along on um, what was an amazing uh, visit to the Barakat house. Mm -hmm. You said that Beirut is not open, but you opened it to us in a very special way. Um, I also want to thank you for the comments around restoration and, and those being seen as surgical stitching. And I thought about, you know, you have surgery and there's going to be a scar and those scars are reminders of a past. Mm -hmm. So I, I really want to applaud you and Frank for um, the great work that you are doing um, and for sharing that with us. I also want to just say to everyone, this is such an important conversation and we realize that we're going a little bit long, but we encourage you to hang in there with us. We're honored uh, this afternoon to be joined by Martha Hartley. Uh, Martha is the Director of Moravian Research at Old Salem Museums and Gardens. So much of her work I think is grounded in understanding history mm -hmm. And then moving to use that history in ways that can affect the world around us in positive ways. Um, I've watched her work and the clarity with which she presents history and research, even when the subject is difficult and painful, is shared with nuance and care. Mm -hmm. At Old Salem, Martha's managed many years of primary research in search of information regarding the enslaved people of the town of Salem. Martha, welcome to the conversation. We're glad to have you. Thank you, Michelle. It's nice to be here. I'd like to pose a question and, and start with you, um, Martha. Um, in a 2002 edition of Anthropological Quarterly, Dr. Lynn Meskel from the University of Pennsylvania wrote, after all, the loss of heritage is an act of symbolic violence on the past and the future. As the erasure of cultural memory severs links with the past, which are integral to forging and maintaining modern identities. Nelly referred to social amnesia. And I know that you've gotten a lot of pushback from folks as you've sought to uh, uncover the hidden town story can you talk about that and, and the trauma that is associated with that? I'd like for you to get us started with that and then invite Nellie and Frank to, to join the conversation. Well, thank you, Michelle. Uh, 
Well, I will just say that uh, racial injustice in America has destroyed and denied African-American heritage in those places. Uh, and so in, a, in, a, in sort of a broad sense, uh, when we think about the United States, we know that we live our history here. And the history here is uh, based on crimes against humanity, colonialization, genocide, human bondage. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very Eurocentric history and because of that, uh, people have been denied their place and they've been, been denied their memory. And uh, it was very interesting to hear about, to hear Nellie and, and the ideas about preserving memory. And, and, and those are the places, and it has to do with places, real places. Uh, there's memory in, in much, there's memory in all history and hearing your relatives talk about their past, but places are, are, are significant to us in so many ways. And uh, we have lost so many important places in the African-American story here. So uh, part of, uh, of the, the legacy of, of racial injustice has been that erasure. And uh, that to the point that you made in the quote, uh, we have to work even harder to bring this, those places to the fore and help us to understand what they are. For example, here in Winston-Salem, uh, the city of Winston-Salem began a program called the Historic uh, Marker Program uh, many years ago to, to mark places with beautiful uh, uh, cast uh, markers for important places. And unfortunately, I've noticed in uh, the, the markers that are selected for uh, erection, many of them are for places in the African-American story that are no longer there. So it is, it is, it behooves us to, uh, to really, uh, really work hard to elevate these stories and uh, stories are there. We have to find them. And there's been, unfortunately in historic preservation, there's a real inclination to focus on architecture. And, uh, and the tools for preservation are typically architectural tools, recognizing historic architecture. But uh, in the African-American world, we know that uh, public policy destroyed African-American architecture, uh, especially in the 20th century with uh, urban renewal and, and highway development through, through cities and countrysides. And also uh, public policies which, um, undervalued African-American uh, homes uh, led to disrepair and bulldozing. So much of the architectural fabric is not there, but that does not mean that the stories are not there and the history is not there, but it requires us to understand the cultural landscape and to invest in the archeological research that we need to do. And that is what we're doing at Old Salem through the Hidden Town Project. And it is through the research uh, and the vast documentation of the Moravian church and their archives that opens these stories to us. And we're able to learn about the landscape of Salem, for instance, which is the origin of Winston-Salem, and how people of African descent were part of that story from the very beginning. And the story of slavery in Salem is very complicated, and I'll not go into that now, but uh, suffice it to say that um, the, the footprint of people af of African descent is over the entire landscape, uh, not just in Salem, but across uh, much of the United States historically and in terms of slavery. So we have to recognize that as, as Frank uh, discussed the tavern room as a point of memory, actually the entire landscape is a place of memory and one might say trauma. So these are things we have to recognize and lift up and it has to be done in hand in hand with the African-American community because it's their history and we can provide the information, but it is a conversation as Nellie said, and that's something that we strive for. So um, that's a very long and convoluted uh, response, Michelle. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Thank you so much, Martha. And you know, each of you is working in your own way um, to make sure that there's this preservation of these places of memory uh, and trauma, and, and so much of what you're having to deal with is, 
issues of public policy. Um, Frank, Nellie, do you want to respond to what Marka has shared with us? Go ahead, Nellie. <laughs> no, you've been silent for like 20 <laughs> minutes now. <laughs> well, Michelle knows that, that, that something that I'm really aware of is how public policy, historic preservation codes, how systemic issues embedded into preservation are in many ways, the very things that are obstacles for us telling the more broad narratives. <clears throat> and Nellie, I be, my ears kind of perked up when you talked about even today, this building is, is a contested artifact. Yeah. Um, and, and so in many ways, as we start to pull out these other narrative stories at Old Salem, they become contested narratives. And for instance, the idea of this tavern room being a room of reflection, in many ways is kind of a con contested idea of what the use and purpose of that room was. And, and so even, even when you have history, that policy and procedure um, and public nostalgia push the opposite direction. So as a public historian, it's something I, I feel constantly um, attacked by. And it'd be interesting to hear what you think about that, Nellie. Yeah, I've heard you talk about that tension. Nellie, what do you think? <clears throat> um, in Lebanon, unfortunately, we do not have any cultural policy that was uh, drawn uh, by the government. Uh, and um, also because this building is not a private building. It's owned by the municipality of Beirut. So they are the ones controlling it. So they do not open it for the public and it's not accessible at all times. So if you are lucky, you can pass by and have like, you know, an exhibition inside and you would be allowed inside. But most of the time it is closed. And it is, I guess, um, uh, done on purpose, you know, because, uh, you know, the government uh, doesn't want us, you know, to talk about the war. They want us just to forget about it and move on because um, the majority of the people ruling now in Lebanon are war criminals that played, you know, an important role during the Lebanese war. So if we are like, you know, opening the building and, and organizing maybe talks and discussions inside, it's like, you know, we are uh, exposing them more and more. So, um, so, so far, you know, this is the problem, but uh, activists are working all the time, you know, to open the building, even for like, you know, simple uh, activities uh, going on inside, uh, even for this fundraising campaign that was organized uh, in August 2020. So um, I guess that people are reclaiming the space as theirs, uh, like all the time. So um, I don't think that they can resist change anymore and the young people the youth they want to talk about the war you know because all the narratives they have are you know a story they heard from their father or their grandfather so we don't have any like written records that you can go and read so uh they want this open this building open for the public where they can ask you know questions and maybe find answers We've got a, a question in the chat. Um, April says, I'm interested in how historic preservation can be a place for healing and empathy. How do you believe your work is helping to bring healing for the hurt and empathy for the aggressors, racist and crimes against humanity? Who would like to get us started with that? Hmm. How is your work helping to bring healing and empathy? Well, I'll, I'll jump in and say, as a public historian, that's, that's my goal. That's why I'm interested in history. That's why I'm history, interested in um, historic sites, because you can't get more grassroots than a historic site. And a lot of times I'll, I'll speak and write about this idea of nostalgia um, and I was talking with a colleague of mine and she, she mentioned this, this notion of myth-making. 
um, and how important myth making was in some ways for kind of social cohesion, but at the same time, it can also be used against society. Um, I, I have long felt that as museum public historians, um, researchers, we, are, we couldn't be more on the line mm -hmm. of, of this discussion. Um, I, I really feel like there is a, the, there is a great need for what we do, um, but many times I feel like it's not necessarily wanted in the full way that the research might be expressing. And it would be interesting to hear what Martha and Nellie have personally experienced about that. That's just my take. Either of you want to weigh in on that? Uh, well, I'll just follow up what Frank said. And uh, from my experience with the Hidden Town Project, it's not only important to uh, understand the landscape and where people were, where they lived and worked, but it's really important to understand who people were and, mm -hmm. and identifying people in the past and then making the connection to the present through descendants, as Frank mentioned, uh, is incredibly valuable. And uh, it, that, that ties history up and makes it relevant today. When people can understand that uh, a man called Abraham who came to Salem with the name Sambo, who was a Mandingo warrior, uh, you know, it, that's fine, but let's understand who, who Abraham was as a man, as, as a person. And, and so it really requires developing biographies about these people in the past. And then, of course, trying to understand their descendants through time that, that, that maybe possibly can bring us up to today. Uh, because history is alive in, uh, in uh, the descendants today. So I would just say that historic preservation uh, has got to remember that it's not just buildings, it's also people, and it's also landscape. So I would just add that. Mm -hmm. In our conversation yesterday, we, uh, I think it was Frank who called these places and, and the stories around them sites of contention. Mm -hmm. and, and back to this myth-making idea. Um, and I'd like to invite each of you to talk about what drives this contention and how you as historic preservationists push back at that notion, especially given that so little is known about the people that occupied these spaces and the spaces themselves. You know, we don't want to, don't, don't, don't tell me about that. I don't want to know that. I want to keep my little myth over here. You're not, you're all nodding. <laughs> Nellie? Um, in Lebanon, uh, I guess we are still exper experimenting with this. We are fighting to uh, preserve uh, the historic buildings and we are still maybe fighting also to uh, make these stories heard by uh, the majority of the people. Um, so um, I can't maybe really tell if we are on the good path or we are getting somewhere because we are Starting, the starting and the building is still not open and many other buildings are also being demolished you know historic sites um, but also I would like maybe to add that one NGO called Fighters for Peace um, that was founded in 2014 here in Lebanon uh, by ex-fighters who fought during the Lebanese war they founded an NGO that promotes uh, peace and uh, also that talked, you know, about these maybe contention and all these disagreements. And what they did, you know, coming from different political factions and parties, uh, they gathered together and they made peace, you know, with this past and with all these, you know, disagreements. And now they are, you know, uh, testifying and talking about it, so especially addressing their talks to the youth and uh, so uh, I find the work like uh, the mission maybe really interesting and exciting and I'm following, you know, uh, uh, how it is um, the development of uh, this mission. And also you can find uh, some of uh, these uh, testimonies of change as they like to call them online on YouTube uh, if you go on their website. 
So it's still like, you know, um, work in progress. Very much so. Frank. I just would, uh, I'm really struck by as soon as, for instance, um, Nelly and I talk about buildings, we, we can't, we, we can't talk about buildings unless we talk about current situations. Mm. I think that preservation has fought long and hard to keep itself neutral, even though we know the very core of preservation is not neutral. <clears throat> so when I'm talking about the Tavern Room of Reflection, you could certainly talk about it from an architectural perspective, but meanwhile, we have Black Lives Matter protests going on in Winston-Salem and around the world. Um, <clears throat> Nellie can talk about the building and they just had protests in the square right in front of the building. I mean, I mean, there is such powerful connection with these places that, that it is impossible to remove the current situations from them. And I think as public historians, preservationists and museum professionals, we need to be embracing that. And we shouldn't be running away from that, but it does matter in terms of policy and decision-making. Because as Nellie said, you know, when the politician wants it one way, then that's the way it's gonna go. We saw it in Gdansk with, uh, with the National Museum, I think of World War II, where they, they closed it back down because the interpretation wasn't, wasn't nationalistic enough. I mean, you really do see preservation being used as forms of propaganda. And that's, that's a really whole interesting conversation. A whole another conversation, yes. right? So we'll have to get back together to <clears throat> more of that conversation. I am aware of our time. Um, I wanna be mindful of our audience. Um, I'd like to invite uh, each of you for any final comments before we sign off. Uh, Bernard, I do see your question over in the chat and we'll get to that. Go ahead for last comments. Frank, you want to start um, Fascinating, this has done exactly what we had hoped, which is to bring about a lot of questions about what we do as preservationists and why. Thank you, Nellie, for joining us. Martha? Uh, well, <clears throat> I will just say that uh, truth in history is paramount and truth in history leads us to reparative justice. And so that is really what it should be about. Thank you for that, Martha. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I uh, truly hope that we will continue this discussion sometime uh, later on maybe because yeah, we raised many questions and uh, it was super interesting. Thank you. We did raise many questions. I, I, I almost see a part two here <clears throat> Talk to our producer about, about <laughs> that. Um, Bernard has a question about, about uh, the enslaved from Africa. And I'd like to put that question aside and have us answer that question for him um, offline, mm -hmm. if that works for everyone else. Sure, Martha, Martha is the expert on that. Absolutely. Martha, we'll get that question over to you. Thank um, you. In closing, I, I just want to again thank uh, Frank and Nellie and Martha for their time today and for sharing with us the amazing connections between preserving those, um, preserving spaces and the memories and the people and the stories that they evoke. No matter how traumatic those stories are, we have heard that this is something that we must do. It is an imperative for us to continue to tell these stories. For anyone who's with us who wants to deepen uh, your knowledge, uh, we have a few resources you can explore on your own. I'm going to drop uh, a link to several books and articles um, in the chat for you now that you can reach out and, and uh, grab if you'd like to do that. And then finally, um, I want to invite you to join us on November 18th at 7.30 p.m. for Things, a global conversation about indigenous culture. Joining us for that conversation are Watson Harlan, 
a member of our Cherokee Advisory Committee, and Dr. Julie Gao, Curator of Indigenous Cultures at the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery. You can register online for free with a donation of any amount at mesda.org or oldsalem.org. And remember, it is your gift that enables us to continue drawing these connections between things and bringing these conversations to you. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>